So, dude, welcome back to the channel. Today, as asked for and backed by popular demand, we are going to get into a couple of dudes that will not end up on any of my teams because I believe they will bust for yours. Now, disclaimer, when I say bust, I don't mean that they're not going to be useful, that they won't put up any fantasy points, that they're not going to play a role on anyone's team. I just mean that where they're being picked in fantasy drafts right now based on their ADPs, they will not return the value of where they're going in their drafts. Therefore, you should stay away, let someone else reach for them. If they happen to fall to you later than their normal ADP, then they could be a value. There's really no such thing as a bust or a sleeper anymore because everyone knows about everyone. There's just too much media, there's too many articles, there's too much TV, there's too much bullshit going around that everyone knows everyone. You can go onto Google right now, type in a player's name, and the first two articles will say, 10 reasons why this guy is going to be a bust this year. The next article will say 10 reasons why this guy is going to be a sleeper this year. It's just information overload and it only matters about value, where they're going in their draft, where you can get them in their draft. Otherwise, it don't matter. So today, I'm going to bring to you five dudes that will probably not end up on my team because I think they're overvalued, where they're being drafted right now. Enjoy. Alright, so let's kick this list off. Number one, not going to be a popular pick in the fantasy community, D-Hop, DeAndre Hopkins. out of Houston, Atlanta, Vegas. I know you're thinking, I'm crazy. I am a little bit crazy, but not for this. And D-Hop finished last year as wide receiver four overall in PPR leagues, wide receiver six in standard leagues, uh, really cemented himself as an elite talent. You know, uh, There's no denying that, I'm not saying that at all. Problem is, in PPR leagues this year, he's being drafted at number four overall. So he has to replicate last year, hit his absolute ceiling in order to return that value. It's not impossible to think it'll happen, um, but I see a lot of red flags from last year and in terms of what it can mean for this year. Now, over the first eight games for D-Hops, I mean, last season was just a tale of two halves for him. First eight games of the season, he was ridiculous. He was averaging over 14 targets a game which would have put him on pace to break the NFL record for most targets in the season. Over 14 targets a game. Um, he was catching upwards of, I think, nine balls a game, 108 receiving yards, and .75 touchdowns. These are averages for the first eight games of the season. Now, let me tell you this. He, uh, I mean, the, the Texans were 3-5 and five over that eight-game span. They were letting up almost 27 points a game to opposing teams. I mean, they were bad. They were really, really shitty. And then, and then, week nine happened. That was their bye. I don't know what Bill O'Brien did. I don't know what he said. I don't know what kind of steroids he put in J.J. Watt's ass. But the following eight weeks after the bye, the team completely flipped the switch. They went 6-2 and two over that span. Um, their defense lit it up, averaging, uh, they allowed 13.5 points per game to opposing teams. Now, what happened was we saw Hopkins' numbers dip pretty tremendously. Not, I mean, still really great numbers, but compared to the first half of the season, nothing like what it was in the, uh, the second half. So his average uh, targets dipped from around 14 to 10. He never saw more than 11 targets in a game over the second half of that year. His numbers dipped uh, below six catches a game. His yards dipped. Obviously, his touchdown rate dipped. He still finished the season so high, but that was mainly because the beginning of the season was so, so strong for him, and people are drafting based off of the production he put up in the beginning of the season. 
Now comes 2017 to, I mean, 2016, I'm so stupid. 2016 season, and now the outlook changes a little bit. We have Brock Osweiler behind the quarterback. Um, now, obviously, that's not going to be an upgrade or a downgrade, really, until we see him play. It can't get much worse than what they had last year, so I'm not really going to uh, get into any details of what I think that means for D-Hop. But we do have Will Fuller, the rookie stud wide receiver, probably going to play opposite of him. Um, we saw him tear it up in the last preseason game. I definitely see him taking away some of those targets that D-Hop had last year. Uh, they also have Jalen Strong. I know he didn't do much in his rookie year, but he looks a lot better this offseason. He shed 10 to 15 pounds, and he's running way faster, way smoother, and I think he's also going to play a nice little role in this offense. Um, and obviously, they went out and signed Lamar Miller to be their featured back here. So they're going to want to run the ball a ton. They're going to want to pass him the ball a ton because he's a great receiving back. So with those three pieces, Strong, Fuller, and Lamar Miller on that offense, I definitely see D-Hop's targets remaining around where they were the second half of the year as uh, compared to the first half where he was literally the only thing that team had going on offense. It didn't matter if he was double teamed, triple teamed, they were throwing it up to him. And he would make the plays. I mean, he's a great fucking athlete. Don't get me wrong on that. But it's unrealistic to expect them to continue to do that with all the pieces around him now. Um, You'd also expect that defense. You know, going into last year, you thought that defense was going to be a stud defense. And we didn't see it actually happen until the second half of the year. So you'd have to think going into this year, they had that confidence. They knew what it took to make them, you know, mesh and make it click. Because that second half of the season was so well done by them that that's what they have in mind for this season coming up. And that's going to be their, their mindset. We want to be a defensive team. We want to be a running team. Uh, no team in the NFL over the last two seasons combined, 14 and 2015, have rushed the ball more times per game than the Texans have. It's over 31 or 32 rushes per game. So clearly that's what they have in mind for this season. They have ground and pound and pound them on defense. Obviously Hopkins is going to put up good numbers because of his raw talent and how good he is as a receiver. Uh, but I can't buy into him taking him as top five pick standard or PPR. It doesn't matter to me. I'll take... Obviously, those top three wide receivers, everyone's talking about Brown, Julio, um, Odell. I'll take A.J. Green over him. Uh, right now, I have Brandon Marshall ranked ahead of Hopkins, so I would probably take him. In PPR, I also probably like David Johnson. I know I kind of went with the zero RB theory in my last couple videos, but uh, I still like David Johnson over uh, DeAndre Hopkins at this point, and I think D-Hop's going a little too high. Numero dos. I really wanted to throw in the entire quarterback position for this one, but we'll get to that at another time. You know how I feel about letting QB slip. But I'm going to get into one dude I think is being so far overdrafted. It's just madness. It's madness. That's Big Benny Roethlisberger. For the Pittsburgh Steelers, man, I love this guy. I think he's elite in terms of leadership, talent, and uh, you know just commanding the team. But he's being picked right now as the fifth quarterback off the board. The fifth quarterback, number 43 overall. This is the average draft position from Yahoo. So the problem here is that Drew Brees is going three spots behind Roethlisberger as quarterback six. Listen to these stats. In Ben Roethlisberger's entire career, his whole career, However many years he's been, he's old as shit, so he's been there for a while. He's thrown for more than 28 passing touchdowns twice. He's thrown for 4,300 yards or more two times. Drew Brees, on the other hand, has hit those marks for nine straight years coming into 2016. So what you're saying is Ben Roethlisberger's ceiling, statistically, fantasy-wise is Drew Brees' average year, every single year. You know exactly what you're getting from Brees, and you don't know what you're getting from Big Ben. I mean, I love the dude, he's a beast, but there, there are red flags there, and there are guys going behind him that I would much, much rather have, Brees, than him. He'll have no Le'Veon for three games, an elite pass-catching running back. He'll have no Martavis Bryant, an elite deep threat for the entire season. And we have no idea what's going on at the tight end position. No more Heath Miller. Uh, who knows what's going on with Ladarius Green? If he's ever going to, if he's ever going to play in the goddamn NFL again. So, I mean, my problem, my problem with Ben 
is that there's just other guys there. Him being picked at quarterback five is ridiculous. I mean, he'll end the season as probably a top ten quarterback fantasy, but the eight to ten range is way, way, way more realistic for this dude. Um, so, capiche. Okay, so we have D Hop. We got Big Ben. And I'm gonna hit you with another wideout that I see as a potential bust this year. That is Kelvin Benjamin out of Carolina with Cam Newton. Not Cam Newton, he's not a bust. Kelvin Benjamin. No denying he had a great rookie season, at least from a statistical fantasy output. Um, but the fantasy community is treating Kelvin or drafting him as if nothing last year happened. He's being taken almost identically, ident identical, identically, I don't even know how to say that word, I feel stupid. Uh, almost exactly where he was taken last year, he's being taken again this year, which is in the mid-30s, so like 33 to 38, which is like a late third round pick, early fourth round pick. And uh, I, I saw a lot of flaws in his rookie season that look like they're probably going to carry over into this year and definitely hurt his fantasy output. Uh, number one, his catch rate was only 50% during his rookie year. He saw 146 targets, only caught 73 balls. Um, his yards after catch was like 2.4 yards after after each catch, uh, his average at least. And among, I think it was 110 qualified wide receivers, he ranked over, I think it was he was 101, ranking 101 in both uh both categories, both catch rate and yards after catch. So he was way, way down on the list in those, and a lot of his production just came purely from volume. He was the sixth most targeted wide receiver in the NFL, and only had uh, the 23rd most receptions. So you could see the, you know, those were not lined up correctly. That shows a lot of inefficiencies. Um, another thing I noticed from his rookie season, he caught nine touchdowns, and a ton of those were in garbage time. So I think four of them came when the Panthers were trailing by at least 20 points. And obviously we saw last year, Carolina's not going to be ever trailing by 20 points. That ain't going to happen. They're a ground and pound team. They're a winning team. Their defense is stacked. Um, so the garbage time points that Kelvin had his rookie year will not be a thing this year. Uh, that being said, they also have Devin Funches emerging. Uh, they have Teddy Ginn on the opposite side of him, who most people completely counted out last year, ended up turning in a really nice fantasy season, especially in those deeper leagues. Um, so there's definitely other targets to go around. He's not going to see the six most targets in the NFL like he did his rookie year. And if he keeps that catch rate, he's in for a brutal, brutal awakening. Um, that being said, I mean, obviously he can improve. He can do better. But, I mean, just the, the output that he produced that rookie year, says a lot about his efficiency. Um, I, I, there was reports coming out of training camp last week, I think, that saying he was struggling with conditioning. And that happens to a lot of players coming off major injuries because they're not getting back into shape uh, in the correct way. And a lot of times bad conditioning will lead to re-injuries. Um, so for me, Kelvin's price is just way too rich. Uh, I don't see him finishing as a wide receiver too. I see him more in like the 900 yard, possibly a thousand yard range, but I see those touchdowns dipping from nine to probably like six or seven. Um, and I just think overall, he's not going to get as much volume with the other weapons there. They are a run first team. They won't be trailing, so he won't get those garbage time points. And he just himself, he's not a great receiver. He can't run with the ball after he makes the play. Um, and he struggles with drops. So we'll have to see if he improves that play. But for me, there's no way I'm taking him with my third or fourth round pick. And you should absolutely not do that either. Whew. Next guy up on my list, number four, Matt Jones of the Washington Redskins. <clears throat> Wanted to get a couple running backs involved now that we got two wide receivers and we got a quarterback in this bust list. Matt Jones, last year came on pretty strong, sort of, behind Alfred Morris. Now Alfred Morris is gone. Matt Jones is expected to be the workhorse in that Washington Redskins offense. Question is, is Matt Jones actually good? Can he handle a workhorse load? 
can he be efficient with it? Can he get in the end zone? Can he really be a number two running back for your fantasy team? Because that's where he's being drafted right now. He's going as running back number 22, I believe, right now. And uh, it's a little rich for my taste, given what we've seen from him. Last year, he averaged 3.4 yards per carry, which is not good. It's actually fucking terrible, but I don't really like to judge rookies based on their yards per carry because we've seen pretty major jumps. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, for example, Damian Tomlinson's yards per carry as rookie year was terrible too. Uh, so you can't just judge off that. Um, but overall, he wasn't particularly efficient. He topped 60 rushing yards only twice. He scored two of his three rushing touchdowns in week two. He had a huge game in week two, which really put him on the map. And then the next 11 games, he scored one rushing touchdown total. Now, he's in a good position to get the volume. What does that mean for him? Uh, in my opinion, not much. I don't think he's going to shoot up his yards per carry number. I don't think he's going to be getting 25 carries a game. Uh, I, I can definitely see the Redskins being down, trailing often. And I see Matt Jones coming off the field because the Redskins have a third down back by the name of Chris Thompson, who's a very, very, very good pass catching back. And he will take Jones out of the game when they're in those situations. He's a little guy. He's like 5'8", 195, super quick, super good at catching the ball. And he put up pretty good numbers in the receiving game last year. Um, so I see Matt Jones really only taking the first and second down carries. So he'll have to be super efficient in order to turn those into, you know, big fantasy numbers. Now, the Redskins have a lot of offense to bring in terms of the weapons. They have Deshaun Jackson back. Obviously, they have Jordan Reed. Kirk Cousins took a huge step forward last year. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see Josh Doxson get on the field or if he's going to start the season on PUP. Um, but I could definitely see them airing the ball out a ton. And uh, that's not good for Matt Jones, obviously. Uh, he'll be running behind the 19th ranked Offensive line according to pro football focus who does this every year in their draft guide. So it's not particularly strong um, No changes were made. They weren't that good last year. So we'll have to see if they take a step forward It's just as likely they take a step backwards So uh, overall, I didn't see much out of Jones that really makes me say hey this guy is going to be a stud this year. He's he's big. He's powerful um, I'm not sure if he really has that one cut ability. I don't know if he has the vision and the footwork to take that next step forward. Right now, he's being drafted ahead of guys like Jeremy Langford, Ryan Matthews, uh, Frank Gore, uh, all of whom should see at least just as much work, if not more, because a lot of those guys will be taking pass catching work as well. Um, so, I mean, I don't particularly hate Jones. I just don't think he should be going ahead of those guys, and I don't think he warrants the draft position that he's getting picked right now as running back 22. So definitely beware there. He's not super efficient in any part of the game, and uh, the offense doesn't doesn't say to me, hey, this guy is going to get a ton of opportunities at the goal line. He's going to break out this year. I mean, he should see upwards of 200 carries, but who knows what he's going to get in terms of Pass catching, who knows how many of those are actually come by the goal line, not to mention his fumbling problems. He fumbled it four times last year in just 145 rushing attempts, something like that. So he puts the ball on the ground way, way, way too often. If that becomes a problem early on, I could see his ass getting benched, like flat out. And um, he, he just injured himself in, in the last preseason game. He hasn't looked good this preseason. Uh, he sprained his AC joint in his shoulder. It's not supposed to be serious, but it could actually linger into week one or week two um, of the regular season. We, we don't really have a sure report yet, so it's hard to say where he's at with that. I wouldn't really look too far into that, but it could be missed time for him. If he misses time, obviously you're going to have to downgrade him even more, and he'll probably be playing with the injury through some of the season, which could, in terms, affect his, you know, his running style, his ground and pound style of, of running, which is what would make him effective. So, Matt Jones. Cross them off that yes boy. All right, that wraps up first four. Oops, let me fix that for y'all. Wraps up four, numero five, last but not least, actually very possibly least, 
guys I probably hate most on this list, and you know this shit is serious, when I took my hat off and I let my brain breathe because I gotta get everything out on the table for this dude, Zach Ertz out of Philadelphia. The tight end in the new Doug Peterson-led Eagles offense. Now, Zach Ertz is being picked as the seventh tight end off the board right now in both PPR and standard leagues, which to me is out of control. Now, he finished as a top six or seven overall when you, if you just look at like an overall finishing uh, points last year. But on a points per game basis, he was tight end 13 in standard and uh, tight end 10 in PPR. So he wasn't actually as good as most people thought. Now, he had a good year overall, 850 receiving yards, saw a bunch of targets. He was a big part of that offense, but he wasn't super efficient. He scored two touchdowns. So he has nine touchdowns in his three years of being in the NFL. Two touchdowns. Now, that, that doesn't get it done from the tight end position when you have a very high reliance on touchdowns for that position. In order to do well, you need to be able to capitalize on red zone looks. Now, people are saying, oh, Doug Peterson's over here. He knows how to use his tight ends. He was with Travis Kelsey. I mean, just because the dude was the offensive coordinator for Travis Kelsey, what does that mean? He didn't do that much for Travis Kelsey. Kelsey scored five times last year. I mean, for someone who's an elite, elite tight end, that's not that good. So, the way that people are assuming Zach Ertz is going to be used is probably wrong. They're going to use a lot of two tight end sets. And they just re-signed Selleck to a three-year extension for pretty decent money for a guy who's going to be just a blocking tight end. They love Selleck in Philadelphia. Um, it's another concern, and it's always been a concern because people always write him off and assume Ertz is going to be the guy there. Uh, but Kelsey last year under Doug Peterson saw three targets the entire season inside the 10 yard line of the opposing team. So when they're by the goal line, they don't even look at Kelsey. Rashad Green, Anthony Fasano, Jericho Cotri, three dudes that saw more targets within the 10 yard line than Travis Kelsey did last year. Let that resonate for a second. Jericho fucking Cotri. So what I'm saying is the Eagles offense is gonna be pretty bad. And now, not only is it going to be bad, but it's going to be super slow. Um, Kansas City, over the last couple of years under Peterson, has been one of the lowest volume passing offenses in the league. They've always ranked in the bottom five in terms of passing plays per game. Philadelphia has always been in the top five under Chip Kelly. So now you're not only getting almost no red zone looks within the 10-yard line, but you're getting about 9 to 10 less passing yards per game overall as an offense, which obviously is going to take away from his opportunities. So I don't see much changing in terms of where Ertz can finish. I mean, he's not going to somehow become Gronk overnight. He's not going to get the looks in the red zone. The offense is going to be much, much slower paced. And, um, you know, they there's not a, a whole lot of upside for Ertz there to be picked as uh, tight end seven. There's tons of guys... Barnage is going after him, Antonio Gates, Dwayne Allen, even Eifert. I mean, I, I'd rather Eifert, knowing that he might miss a couple games, I would take over Zach Ertz. Ertz is probably like my 13th, 14th ranked tight end this year because I, I honestly don't see a lot of upside with him. There's a floor there, but I mean, it's not high because the touchdown totals are going to be so low for him. Um, Ertz is a guy I would absolutely stay away from. Sure, he might have one or two big games, and those will be his touchdown games. Maybe he'll score four or five touchdowns this year, but um, overall, I'm staying away from him in any any one of my drafts. So I suggest you do the same. And that wraps up my five busts for this year. Five dudes that are overvalued, getting picked too high. Let them fall if you want them. If not, let someone else reach, chop it down. It'll hurt their team in the long run. You capitalize on those picks. Let someone else screw up their team, and you'll be sitting pretty. Uh, next episode on the channel, I will either be doing, maybe I'll do a top uh, yeah, five dudes that I think are undervalued right now that you should hop on. Um, maybe bold predictions, one for each division, or maybe me and Nick will wrap up the third and fourth round of the mock draft. Not sure yet, but stay tuned. It will be coming this week. As always, thank you guys for watching. Go follow us on the Twitter 
at BDGE underscore fancy FB if you enjoyed thumb it up if you didn't enjoy still thumb it up leave a comment ask a question say some stupid shit I don't care I'll respond to you DM me on Twitter if you want any personal advice life advice financial advice man I'll give it all to you guys man um, I think that's it. Anyways, I'll see y'all next episode.